My name is Juliana Nicolasian, and with me is Tanya Fincham. We're with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. Today is Friday, July 1st, 2011, and we're in Hugo, Oklahoma, interviewing Charles Baggett. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Well, let's begin by learning a little more about you. Could you tell us the year you were born and where you were born and give us a little bit of background on your family? Sure. I was born in Hugo, Oklahoma, 1941, May 27th, uh, above a bank. Uh, it was uh, right downtown, in the intersection of uh, Highway 70 and 271. Uh, there's upstairs of uh, just an old bank. The one doctor primarily brought everybody in this world. If you weren't born at home, uh, you were born at that hospital at that time. There were two hospitals, but he was, he was Dr. Johnson, E.A. Johnson. Uh, my father was uh, in the car business. Uh, it was during, of course, during the war, uh, right before the war, uh, World War II. But he had been a little bit in the car business before that. And my father grew up somewhat poor, I, say, I should say. His dad had no education whatsoever. Uh, they were sharecropper type people, worked hard all their life. Uh, and then when my dad was born, he, I guess it was his freshman year in high school, uh, he was uh, had to drop out of school, not necessarily had to drop out, I don't think, as much he told me later, but he wasn't enjoying it because he was being teased for the, for the clothes he had and everything. And uh, so he had the, unfortunately, he did drop out in, in the ninth grade. Uh, had uh, went to work, did, did numerous things. He was born in 1915. Uh, he uh, experienced this, had the desire then, of course, for his son to, to graduate from college because no one had and so and I, I do have a, a photo in front of the Edmund Lowe Library of the three of us standing there at one time uh, the, uh, and I was probably the third proudest baggage in the photo that day when I graduated but but uh, he grew uh, he started uh, a gentleman by the name of Presley B. Cole who was uh, had some Indian blood uh, he'd worked for him a short time before the war and he told dad, he said, uh, and I didn't know that my dad ever sold Fords for several years, you know, we were, we were GM and, and had a Buick in our driveway from the time I remembered cars. Uh, so he told him, he said, Herman said, you're a, you know, you don't have a lot of money, I know, and said, I do, and says, I don't like to work, but you do. And he said, I, I and, and it was true, you know, I mean, he, he could think of ideas and things, but he, he just didn't want to be out selling the cars and doing the, the hard work of it. So they went in 50-50, he said, I think after the war, I, and it was such a problem at that time, but I think I can get the Buick GMC franchise. And so, true enough, they this came through, they got the, the franchise, and, and, and of course, you couldn't get vehicles at that time, and I'm tell, telling the story from what he's told me, of course, but so it was most difficult, and then when the cars did come in, the rationing got up through uh, primarily, well, it was. It really turned into a tremendous business for them. Uh, that little shop, incidentally, was about down the stairs from where the dealership was, and uh, we were right behind it at the time. Then, uh, Dad, uh, I guess it was 1952, perhaps, that he he bought Mr. Cole out, and and well, actually, they bought a, a dealership in Durant for a short time, and and Mr. Cole ran over that went over there, and then but he bought him out. But great great people. Uh, I kept in touch with them, but both of them had died too because they were, they were certainly good to us uh, and got, got daddy to break. Uh, then I guess I joined the leadership. I w grew up in the leadership, uh, washing cars, changing oil, uh, loved every part of it. Parts department didn't like that much. Uh, didn't like the service department as much, <laughs> but just had a it's a wonderful business to be in, and particularly work later on. I was able to work with my father side by side, and that was a, a thrill. Uh, but grew up in it. Graduated from high school here. Uh, went through grade school, high school here. Uh, played sports, played the band, played uh, just things like you do in high school. Had probably the, the best classmates you could ever hope for. We still are together, close, close friends. Uh, we uh, have. Several have made big time good. Uh, uh, one of them was at OSU when he, when he, basically uh, 
had to leave because of funds and became a calligrapher, and he's internationally known, Ken Brown, uh, in our class. But grew up in a great environment in Hugo, Oklahoma. It's always been home to me. Uh, I, I could call it a one-horse town, but I didn't want anyone else to, you know. Uh, but it's been great. Long ways from Stillwater, I know, when, you, when you're driving back and forth. But, but I did grow up there. Uh, served after college. I served uh, some time in, uh, in the Army. Uh, did go through the reserve uh, because I couldn't get a passing ear test for the ROTC Air Force when I paid off Stillwater. But, but I came back, and, and I guess I've been here basically ever since in Hugo uh, and supported the community in what ways I could. Uh, worked and had the dealership. and. We moved to several different locations as our business expanded, but uh, truly a, a wonderful, wonderful place to raise your children. Uh, I have two sons, and we had, uh, it was one in the days when they could walk down the street, uh, and they really were friends with some of the circus people, uh, of course, uh, their, their age, and, and it was the greatest thing in the world for them to go out and get to ride an elephant today if they want to, or whatever, you know, if that was the case. but. It's a unique experience to grow up in a small town. I uh, wouldn't trade for it. it and it, it's not a, you're involved in everything, so to speak. Uh, it's, and once you, once you build friendship, you know, you, you, they last forever and they'll come to your aid. And so I'm, I'm very fond of Hugo, very fond of everything uh, uh, that goes on here. We've, uh, we've got a real, real fine city and uh, we're proud of our circus industry. Couldn't ask for, for better people. Well, what's your earliest circus memory? Oh, probably 40, I was, I was probably seven, seven years old, maybe when uh, DR and dad had been friends for years. The, the circus came here in around 41 or 42, uh, and dad immediately became friends with, with several of them. Uh, Kelly Miller, Mr. Obert Miller, the father of the two. Uh, so. I really don't know. I, I, I've been to circuses all my life. Uh, I uh, have to go in the back door sometime because if they're out of town, we uh, we just never paid, to be, you know, that we were their guest. And, and I, you didn't realize it as a child, I guess, but you were beating some civic organization that was sponsoring them out of a ticket. But, but yeah, they insisted that we came and, and we, we could see the backside of the circus also, you know, and, and just, just go, had free free reign to go wherever we wanted to. Uh, but I'd, I, it had to be, you know, maybe before I went to grade school. It was the first, first, first experience I can recall. But, but they would always show, it, it, years ago, they would show here as, it, as they go out. And, and many times that's kind of a dress rehearsal in, in somewhat because the first show and bringing all the acts in. And this is a, a monster circus, the, the, the large one. Of course, there's several that cir uh, wintered here in Hugo. But it's a, uh, later they started opening in Paris, Texas, and that was very successful for many, many years. And we'd, of course, go over there. And, uh, but it had to be, had to be the late, late 40s or mid 40s when my first experience with them. Well, tell me a little bit about the relationship between D.R. Miller and your father. Very, very close. Uh, just, they were a lot alike in so many ways, uh, yet, different DR uh, amazing individual could remember anything whatsoever uh, I'm I, when I built a new facility uh, I came in one day and he just asked that was it cost you every morning when you open the door and he, he had and he didn't write anything down like that and I told him so two or three years later he came in and says or, well, are you still making that much of that particular figure every day? I said, well, so far we're doing, we're making it and exceeding. But he was so remarkable in the, that he could remember these different towns he played in throughout the United States. How many people were there? They had to have an extra show uh, to put them on. How many tickets they sold? Uh, where they set up? Uh, and he and Dad just, uh, in fact, I, my mom always had to lock Dad up when they left because he wanted to go out with a show each year. Uh, they were, they just, he really loved it. Uh, people came to town. Dr. was just uh, a good customer. Uh, he just he would call us from anywhere and he was out. And, and if you got this, I, I need one brought to me. We've had a truck break down or whatever. Uh, and if he couldn't, if they couldn't wait till we got. If they were, you know, halfway across the country, it couldn't happen. And and 
one year, I recall, he ordered, uh, he wanted three um, two-ton trucks, basically, or what they were pulling a lot of, three, two and three-ton trucks, which we could not handle at our dealership. But I was in high school, and Dad said, hey, you want to fly to Michigan and, and piggyback two big trucks out to Washington, Walla Walla, Washington? And I said, he said, the show's out there, and they need them, and I, I found them, and I located them, and so if you want to, and that's when they stack them up two behind the third, the other one. And, and so we did a little research and there was one of the states at that time, and I think it was Oregon perhaps, I don't recall, but one of the states, dad came in and said, well, son, said that, that deal's off. He said, uh, you're not old enough to, to drive that truck through those states, even though you have the license to do it, you can't do it. And so I didn't get to fly up there and do it and go out and show it. But they would have, you know, then, and we shipped them on out by someone else. Had so much. But he, they were just good friends. Uh, he would call and, and and if he needed something, then he'd come in and say, "How much do I owe you for getting that little mess squared up or something?" You know, and he said, "You don't know me anything." He said, "Oh, it had cost you something." And, and that, but just they were just you now they didn't do a lot of things together other than you know he I did Dr. flew some and Dad would go up every now and then, but uh, in the plane or something. But as far as they're this, they were only here like three months out of the year, and, and they don't they don't golf in, in the winter time. They don't do any of those things because they're too busy getting ready for the next year. But as far as a friend, uh, you could you could count on Dr. Miller uh, and, and Barbara and all of them. Uh, Kelly Miller, Kelly died. I was probably in high school, maybe when Kelly died, uh, maybe. In that, but but he was, he'd gotten cancer and the brother of Dr. And uh, but uh, it, we've just. We just known them all of our lives. Well, tell me a little bit about the relationship between the circus and the business community in Hugo. Very good relationship. Uh, circuses have a somewhat bad image traditionally wherever they go, and and uh, people don't see behind the scenes, don't see what they do. They would try to make it back to Hugo if they needed certain things for equipment uh, so they could buy them locally. First of all, they liked it because they knew who they were dealing with and if they could go back in. There was a Ned Edinger, they had a hardware store here, great friends of theirs, uh, Ed and Lucy Edinger. Uh, uh, Wayne Sanguin had a uh, welding shop, uh, worked with them all the time, would go out on the show if they needed now, of course, they have their own welders and things go, but Wayne developed uh, the canvas roll uh, to roll the tent up on a big spool, and uh, he and DR, DR had lots of times would come up with these ideas and, and tell Wayne what he wanted, and they'd get together and do it. Uh, even they had uh, the seating deal, they got, so he got to thinking, if we put those on those trucks and fold them, where they'll fold down flat, and then we can put some other things on top of that. Uh, they're always thinking how to save the money. It's expensive when you start rolling that many big trucks across the country. Uh, feed stores loved them. Uh, they knew to stock up more feed when 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 they came in. It was, back in the old days, they didn't have their own feed mixers at the, at the circus, and so a lot of the livestock had to have that. The hay industry loved them because elephants eat an awful lot of hay, plus they use a lot of hay for their uh, bedding and things like that and cleaning it out so uh, I at one time knew some figures that it, they spent each day for hay and, and, and for fuel and so of course they uh, they just they're always always spent their money here they've, they've made donations numerous donations in this community that people don't know about uh, they uh, they started the Hugo High School Foundation there was a lump sum of a hundred thousand dollars and then they've added to that sum since then I know um, They've uh, Masonic Lodge at one time, and, and Dr. was a Mason. Uh, he was a big Shriner. They started it, uh, or they had a, some damage, wind damage, and pulled part of the roof off. And they started a fundraiser, and and one day it was coming into the rainy season, and he, and he went down and on his own. He says, "How much you like toward the goal?" And he said, "Well, we're, I think it was twenty eight hundred dollars, or something, or maybe thirty two hundred dollars short still that we to do it." And he wrote him a check for it. Didn't want anyone to know it. Just you know, let's let's get it fixed. You know, and that type. A lot of things like that. Uh, if you needed something, they were there for you. Same token. You know, uh, we knew something 
happened, one of them even hospital, we went there. Uh, Dad loved to travel and, and they, were, they made numerous trips and one of his goals was to be in all 50 states and he would, we, uh, back then you could drop ship, so to speak, or we actually would pick it up at the factory, drop ship a, a new car in Bangor, Maine, and, and my mom and dad and her sister and my uncle, Mott Springs, would fly to Bangor, Maine, and uh, the dealer would have the car there, and, and he they'd get, it was our car, of course, and then they'd drive it back from Bangor, Maine, but they always managed to work it some way they would go by where the show was. Uh, and of course, drive up on a lot. Never tell them they were coming. You know, they loved to surprise. He loved to surprise Dr. But he would go out of his way several miles to make sure. And I did the same thing. I was in St. Louis one time and drove, oh, probably, probably an extra three hours driving time or four just to make a route. I knew where the uh, show was at that time and stopped by, and uh, visited for a couple hours and had dinner, and, and then we I headed on to Hugo. Uh, but but we've uh, we've always been have been part of our family, so to speak, and, and uh, it was uh, good friends. Did you ever want to be part of the circus? I didn't have that. You know, I did, and one my dad did. Uh, like I say, he would have been a clown. He said he couldn't do anything else. We all had that infatuation with it. Oh, it was uh, somewhat. I had I. I heard this cornet player they had, a trumpet player, and, and he could just get up, and of course, when I was a kid, and I thought, wow, that'd be something, because he, he could. And so when I did get a little interest in music, I, I, I picked the, the cornet and, and, and came and did it. One of my true heroes, and it was about four or five years older than I, but he was a, really a tremendous trumpet player for the band, and, and one year he went out on the show with them for the summer. That's what he wanted to do, he, and so they they needed him, and he, he took off and, and worked two or three months and, and just as a part of the band. And but they had the live band, and then later on, of course, they came to music, uh, kind of a tape type deal. And, and because those people in the band did, they weren't really wanting to get out. You do several things when you're out with the circus. You're not just a band member. You know, you have to do setting setting up everything. So, but yes, uh, he had that desire. I, uh, I just, i more. I think I'm, I marveled more at, at what they did, and and to see this show set up, you know, to go out there every morning and watch them put that big top up, and huge big top with, and uh, then uh, of course David Rawls' uh, family has all been circus. His show was outstanding. Also, they they were there's several circuses that wintered here, but we were probably closer to the Millers and. And Bird came around than, than the others. But yeah, I uh, I don't know that I'd want to go. I don't know that I want to work that hard. <laughs> well, as a as a business owner, could mm -hmm. you tell when they came home from the winter? Was sure. there a definite traffic increase, business increase, or did it just feel the same? Oh, it it, it was different for us because our friends came home. You know, we were eager to see them, and uh, and as far as a lot of the people that traveled, particularly the entertainers and, and the performers, were they would probably go to Vegas and work three months or something, uh, or they'd go to another show, or they'd go home to their homes where their family were, uh, if if there were those those people. Uh, we did sell many of those. Uh, in fact. Uh, Kirby Grant, who was the original Sky King, uh, you, you, you probably don't remember anything about Sky King, but he was uh, had an airplane, uh, I forget now the young lady, but it was a Saturday morning deal, uh, serial on TV uh, when it first came out. He came out with them for a while. A lot of those people that, that, that associated with nice guy, we sold him cars, but as far as the impact, the, the Again, the hay industry, uh, of course, they come in in, in November, they, they're needing hay and they, they, they buy it. They're, they're sharp buyers, they have to be, you know, wherever they go. They, they kind of book in advance and maybe pay in advance uh, uh, on that. Uh, but, but they uh, bought some cars, more trucks. They, they want to make sure they had, at that time, they pulled travel trailers a lot. Uh, they didn't have the gigantic motorhomes or gooseneck trailers. And, and so, uh, and of course, later on they did. But when they, when they first came home, it would probably be just uh, they they weren't 
bad about just going out and spending all their money when they came in. Uh, they, they knew they had to get by for another three months because they were basically unemployed for three months, some of them. Uh, the, the, the rest of us and most people were out on the show and had a place to stay, but those, but a lot of them have homes here. They, uh, beautiful homes, they uh, stayed here. They, uh, I, I could name names with, and I wouldn't, I don't want to name too many. I'll fit, forget somebody that was really, uh, but with all the different shows over the years and even some of the local people here, uh, a local dentist got involved with one of the shows financially at one time and, uh, and but we're just all good friends, good, good fellowship we've enjoyed through the years. Uh, probably our service department would have a little business, but they had mechanics too that worked on their equipment, and particularly after they got into the diesel trucks and the bigger trucks. But as far as they always bought cars, uh, when Barbara was going to school, she came in one day, she wanted a certain car, I remember, and she came in, she was going to Oklahoma, State, Oklahoma University, and she, uh, drove in one day to pick up her new car, you know, and, and just uh, made sure they bought it from us. It was a Buick Riviera, that's what she wanted. And I can recall it the day she pulled in up there. I think you've got a car around here for me somewhere. <laughs> I said, yeah, we do, Barbara, just exactly what you want. But uh, the, they were loyal to you. If they couldn't buy from you, they wanted to buy from you because you may help them sometime in life and they don't forget that. Would you ever employ Circus workers had a couple of them uh, that came in. Uh, we we didn't have a lot of turnover. I, I think most employees I ever had was like twenty nine, and and we didn't hire anyone in the sales. They were too busy. The ones that had any kind of job, so to speak, with the circus. The roustabouts were were out looking for work uh, somewhat, but they still hung around the show if they if, because they needed to take care of the animals here more so and and get ready. And of course. You cannot believe what goes on that three short months they're here as far as repainting equipment and redoing equipment and welding things that they've hobbled in on. And, and they, they don't, I don't know how much, probably about a week is the maximum vacation they get, uh, even when they're here. It's just, they're just busy all the time. Did not, I had one guy that uh, married a, a lady here and he'd been out with the show a while and, and he was just kind of a, um, Changed all vehicles for us and things like that, and stayed stayed with us quite a, quite a while. But he was a uh, good employee, uh, just but didn't didn't ever hire a lot of a lot of them. Didn't want them to think I was trying to steal their employee. <laughs> <laughs> well, during your father's time or your time, did you ever uh, engage in any uh, cross promotional uh, type of thing? Had a couple of things. They have, uh, we had one guy that was a dear friend too. He, he didn't own the circus, but his name was Frank Ellis. He and Dad were close. Uh, Frank was a promoter deluxe. <laughs> and people seeing this will know, of course, if they, if they knew Frank. Uh, quite a character. Would uh, <laughs> he, he was always, he, he, he had a little gambling problem at times. He called me one time when Dad was out of the country and wanted me to send him some money to Las Vegas because he was coming home. and. And uh, I managed to get some together to send him. And then about four hours later, he called again for some. And I said, this is going to be the last bunch. I don't have any money, Frank. But, but you had to know Frank. But he was, he was a, a promotion deal, more or less. He, uh, when the Pontiac Judge came out, they had a little orange color. They called it, Here Comes the Judge. Uh, was a, and it was a promotion that Pontiac had. And, and when I got one in, well, Frank happened to be by. And he says, hey, says, uh, we need to bring that out. It, they were going out that, and they were showing here in Hugo, and he said, we need a hundred dollars. We'll just take it in there and advertise and tell them to go down and see the judge at Baggett Motor Company. And, and so, you know, we went for the deal, or I did, uh, just to help him out, I guess. But uh, they, he pulled the car in and out just like that. I mean, <laughs> we were his friends, so to speak, but, that, but we knew it going in. Uh, Frank was just that way, but he was always promoting something. But as far as any of the other, uh, I don't think we were involved in, and they were more involved with Cholet when that, with the elephant deal with, with the, the big company at times, they, they made that agreement. Uh, and, but we're friends with the local Cholet dealer too. He was a uh, great friend, Joe Finley, and it had several Cholet dealers. And eventually we took a franchise, but by that time they weren't, they weren't doing 
uh, Chevrolet. It was, it was quite impressive when you walk in. It's a good, good deal for Chevrolet and it's a good deal for the circus. Did you sponsor any ads like in their route books? And Every comments? year we always had an ad in there uh, it's, uh, and just whatever uh, we could. Uh, I'll say this, what, whatever monies I've spent in my life, whatever I've done as far as uh, with the circus and, and going and everything, I'm still indebted probably about three to one. They've been that much better to me than I've been to them. Uh, they really, uh, whatever you need at any time, they were there for you. Uh, just So I, uh, but we did, we advertised with them and uh, didn't hesitate at all. You know, it wasn't one of those hard sales when they came to our place because they were good friends. And they didn't buy every car from us, you know, I mean, but they bought an awful lot of them. Well, after your fat father passed on, mm -hmm. you also maintained close ties with the Miller yeah. family. Yeah, Barbara was more close to my age, of course, and DR and I got closer after Dad died. Possibly he'd, he'd stroll by because he was in Hugo more after that. His wife was having some health problems, and, and he came back, and, and he was just going bananas, you know. he. He called several times a day to make sure what was going on, and 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 just he and I got close. He would uh, sometime we'd meet for breakfast, uh, and he'd just want to want to talk. And uh, sometimes it just by happenstance we'd we'd see breakfast at a local restaurant or something. But but we'd talk, and he'd get a he'd get a uh, napkin out, and he was telling me about the endangered ark, and uh, it was it was just going to be a place where you could come, and kids could have fun, they could ride elephants, they could do things. Anyone wanted to learn to be a circus performer, they could. Wasn't any contract to sign up with them. They did, he just wanted to promote the circus. That was his life and all his life, and and he wanted to promote it. So he would, he'd get that napkin and draw it out. Sometimes we'd have to go out the house and he'd show me some other scheme he had. You know, I mean, uh, 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 this. He said, "I think I can put this over here and still have room for this." Well, I didn't know, but how much room it takes and what all goes on, but but but. He, he shared that with me, and we became friends. And, and he would—I uh, don't—I don't know if he was maybe missing Dad as his friend, and and he was relating to me somewhat because we'd been friends. Or I don't know if he saw in me a little bit of Dad that he wanted to share. But we became closer friends probably in the last five years than we did he and I. That is, uh, but uh, remarkable. Remarkable memory of this guy and uh, some of the stories that you know he's he I forget how many truck wrecks he'd been in two air I believe it's two crashed two airplanes uh, one boat sinking and and, and survived he, he, he's a survivor um, he, he loved to tell about it loved to tell about it well tell us a little bit about Dr's funeral spectacular uh, that's the way he wanted it I'm sure. When he when he died, uh, I think it was a month and a half, two months, maybe they they froze the body because the show was not here and they wanted to be here and he wanted he would want them to. Uh, then when they had the deal that several of the people said they were everybody was talking about it in town. Of course, you know here's the circus icon uh, to the circus world. They didn't realize so much at that time, but but everybody in the circus business knew Dr. Miller. And if it didn't, they didn't know him tomorrow because he'd be at their door if the circus was for sale or whatever. He, he just he kept up with everything and he knew more than anybody knew. You know how he found out things I don't know, but he uh, this the day the services and I was they asked me if I would get a eulogy from the, the local people here, the city of Hugo people, and uh, I was honored to do so. Uh, tough job, tough job. Uh, but it was a, we set it up in a circus tent, and it was uh, under the big top. I don't know how, how many hundreds of people came. I told people, I said, boy, he'd, he'd love to see this crowd today if they were paying people, you know. But uh, several circus names from all over the country came, flowers everywhere. Uh, it was just, and, we, and uh, several small speeches were given, you know, and everything, tributes. Uh, you didn't realize probably till that day until really how how well known he was in the circus field. Uh, you know, we just knew him as Dr. Miller. Uh, so the uh, 
but it was quite a deal of production. And, and some of the people would call me and says, boy, I'd love my kids to see that, but I said, we hate to go out on the street, you know? And I said, hey, this, this, they performed. This is, a, this is a, just another show. This is just his last show. And so they, they had some buses. They, would, they told people, said, if you want to park your car at the Agriplex where the services were, where they set up the tent, and said, and you want to park it there, we have some buses, we'll take you to the cemetery, get back on them, we'll take you back to your car after the service, because there's not, not a little room out there to park the hundreds of cars, and there were literally, would have been hundreds of cars probably going out. But the streets were lined with little kids watching all this, and, and of course they had uh, the, uh, the uh, horse and carriage that, that carried them. I believe I'm right, came from Peru. I'd have to double, double check, but, but several ornate wagons coming in uh, uh, to carry the, the, the deal. And they had, uh, had elephant, of course, walking along. They had uh, llamas, whatever. Uh, several of the animals made the, made the trip to the cemetery, some probably a mile, mile and a half away from where the circus ran. But uh, people are lying in the streets, just like when the circus comes to town or any other parade comes to town. Many of them wanted to pay tribute. Uh, many of them wanted to just see it because they'd never, <laughs> never seen a funeral like that. And uh, I know he, uh, he would have been proud. Well, can you talk a little bit about Showman's Rest? Showman's Rest, uh, you've got to see it. And I think it's now on the Historical Society's list and there's busloads coming. Unique in every way, a lot of unique heads, headstones uh, came about by funding uh, from one of the elephant trainers and, and Handlers that had been there for years had saved some of his money, and then DR, uh, when they found out his name was John Carroll, and so John was not an educated person, also, but uh, DR uh, and bought bought the land, and, and John with some of the money they started a, a special foundation and bought land called for Showman's Rest, and just about it's, a, it's nearly a whole section of the. Uh, cemetery there and it's probably uh, probably not over about 10 people that were previously buried there or bought lots there that are not not circus people but the rest of them in some way some of them want to come back uh, there's one big deal there that uh, the guy was never been in the circus been in his life just a retired marine he and his wife came back they uh, had done well I think in uh, California Arizona someplace came back, uh, got involved with it, managed his, uh, some of the business for him for a while. Uh, he's in showman's rest uh, there, and, and uh, then the, they, in fact, his wife later was part of owner of one of the circuses. Beautiful place to see. It's, it's undescribable. You just have to have some of the pictures, and then if you, once you see those, you want to make sure you do come uh, to see showman's rest. But it's, uh, our cemetery is well kept and, and just kind of a treasure itself. It's uh, built when the WPA days, and like our school stadium and several things, the, the rod of the armories of those days, they uh, did the cemetery. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Bill Darrow that came into some money, uh, never married, uh, lived above one of the drugstores in town uh, and dealt with the stock markets and, and hit it well. And so, and he was a member of our church also, and, and spent a lot of money on the cemetery as a and relationship. In fact, his mother named Hugo, uh, yeah. Mrs. Darrow, and it was named after Victor Hugo. And so there's a tribute out there, from, uh, not far from where my dad's uh, side is, and also from, the, dad's probably a couple of sections away from there, and they probably want me to move him if, <laughs> if he knew DR was over there now. But uh, just, it's, uh, Unique cemetery in itself, with not only circus people, but uh, Freckles Brown and, and Lane Frost and some of the world champion cowboys that are there. And very unique. Eddie Angeli, the little guy with Buster Brown shoes. Uh, very, very unique cemetery. The circus, uh, I don't know how you can describe it without seeing it. <clears throat> you see these tombstones shaped like a circus tent, uh, Calliope wagon wheel, uh, numerous numerous different ones, elephants around the little stands all the way around, and it's uh, not huge, but it's beautiful and, uh, and 
they're all they're all together. I'd like you to take me a little bit through town from what you remember, specifically with a focus on the early locations of the company, okay. your, your father's okay. business. Okay. He started out in uh, 45, like I said, uh, and it was, I mean, it was <laughs> a shanty little little deal, you know, and uh, no showroom. Had parts department, you know, the cars, I don't know, they were parked, we had a used car lot on West, uh, East Jackson, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, it stayed there from 1945 till 1986, we had that car lot. It expanded a couple of times by buying the property and, and did some work on it. But then uh, that was, then he moved in 52, uh, he needed more room and, and he moved down on North A down by the Frisco Depot. The, the, and then there's a nice uh, circus display in the Frisco Depot Museum. Uh, Moved there. I was. I know it was like '53 because uh, that's when Buick came out with a valve and head engine, uh, which I'm sure relates to both of you real well. Uh, but I was so proud of showing off people. We had a V8 engine in a Buick. You know, there were straight eights at that time, and I was still a youngster but loved the car business. Uh, we didn't stay there long because it was off the beaten track, and we got the opportunity to move where the the old Studebaker dealer had been. This was franchise that had gone out and there were two two people in town. Ironically, the Ford dealer's daughter was in my class. The then Chevrolet dealer's daughter was in my class. The uh, Studebaker daughter was in my class. Uh, they were not there when I graduated in 59, but because they'd taken, it, it was no, no longer a division, but we were in that building. So we had, we had the, pretty well had the car industry sized up in our class, class of 86 people. Uh, but we moved there and it had a service station involved. Uh, I don't think if I'd known that myself, I would have made that decision because it was my job then to a lot more tire changing and pumping gas and, you know, quarters worth of gas, you know, would go a long way. If they get a dollar worth, four, four quarters, you know, you could get four gallons of gas. Uh, but good to meet the people, learn how to deal with the public, uh, you know, and there's people that's hard to deal with in any business. Uh, Taught me an awful lot. Taught me the manual labor that I didn't want to do the rest of my life. And, uh, uh, but it was a unique experience. I later went to work in the summer. Uh, uh, superintendent of schools here decided that one summer he says, I got you a job at an oil company. I said, well, I'm gonna work down at this place with dad. And he said, no, you don't need to work with your dad all your life. You need to get out and see and work for somebody else, see if you can, you know? And so wisdom, great wisdom. And uh, I said, well, I had to check with dad. He says, ah, just tell him I said, you're going to work with this other guy <laughs> this summer. And so, so I did. And I worked for him and unique experience, super nice guy, <clears throat> great experience. Uh, but I got out of it, pushed pumping gas for a little while, I guess. Then it was, uh, probably around 69, I guess, perhaps, uh, we moved to another facility, uh, again, in downtown Hugo. We had lots scattered, but this time I had my eye on getting Chevrolet and we had Buick, Pontiac, and GM. So Dad got Pontiac and, and the dealership uh, in 1959. Uh, and so at that point we had three franchises and, and two, in the, he had a, a Rambler franchise, American Motors at one time uh, franchise here uh, and, and Dodge Chrysler uh, in a separate deal he was part interested in. Uh, but we moved around to East Duke, uh, and it's 121 East Duke was right across from the city drugstore, and it's a gift shop there now, but it was, we thought that was outstanding, and we had a uh, car lot right across the street for our new car displays, which we'd never had before. We used to have to keep them in a warehouse about a block away just to show the cars, and there wasn't as much emphasis on showing a fancy car at that time. It was, pickups mostly were standard shifts when I was to first started selling, and and uh, you could buy a new pickup for seventeen hundred and seventy-six dollars from us, and uh, and that didn't include a radio, but it was that was what the selling price. And and if we we'd sell within a, a bumper, and uh, and some pickups didn't come with heaters even at that time. And and uh, Dad had a little trouble. I was young and thought, well, we need to dial some of these pickups up a little bit. You know, some people just buy them for cars. 
oh, don't you can't sell an automatic transmission in a pickup around here, you know. And I, so I, I never forget one day, I said, well, I'm going to order one of these two-tone, and I kind of tricked it up, so to speak. And, and uh, boy, we sold them like hotcakes, and, and he couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> but we, you could make probably about $75 profit. Of course, at that time, that was bigger bucks than, than it is today. But if you got a $75 profit deal, you really had a, had a deal counting, selling them the bumper they needed and everything put it on and things like that, but, and maybe a radio if they wanted it. But and of course, Hugo, there's no FM in this area at that time uh, at all. So FM didn't mean a thing to us. It's just AM radios. But the, uh, the prices have changed considerably since then. I, uh, I came back out of college in 64 or five, I guess, and, and joined dad. Uh, and spent a little time in the military uh, right after that. But then been here ever since. Wonderful relationship with my dad. We've only had one disagreement in our life. Uh, and it was uh, when I was in high school. Uh, he won that one. Uh, he, uh, I found out real quick that uh, smart was, worked better with the word uh, brain than it did with mouth. And <laughs> so, uh, but it was a. Uh, we, we never did have a disagreement. In fact, when I got in the business, even in advertising or something, someone would come in and say, hey, you need to be doing this. You need more more advertising. And I'd go for it, you know, and next month he'd say, well, how'd that, how'd that go? You know, and he knew already. And he, I'd say, well, it didn't. We sold two more new cars, which we could have done that without it probably. And he said, well, now you know. And that's the way he taught me. And it wasn't anything. I told you that wouldn't work. And occasionally we would have a deal that I'd say, did no wonder they traded with you as much as you put in their trade in and you know you're like just and he said hey i'll be all right and he'd go sell it just to show me that he, he was right and, and he could he, he could sell circles around me and um but we had such a unique relationship dad and i uh just more like brothers at times uh had to share everything with each other and, and whatever it was and uh one time i you know, you kind of hear what you want to hear at times. And I, my desire was to be able to outsell him. And I knew I never could because he, he can just, just had that ability. He grew up when you had to sell the people that came in. Later on, you wanted to sell them more of what they wanted, I guess. And and he, he told me one time, he said, son says, he was listening in on a conversation. I was making one of my classmates and I was trying to sell him a car. And he said, uh, after they left, he walked out of my desk and I said, they couldn't afford the new car. And he said, son said, uh, you probably, you, what, I'm proud of your financial wisdom you gave them. And that's right. But he says, they want a new car. And said, they're not gonna wait on you. He said, when they go around and he named a salesman at the Chevrolet place, he said, when he, when he gets through with them, so they'll have a new Chevrolet in their drive tonight. And I said, oh no, they'll wait for me, dad. They're a classmate of mine now, you know, I'm, I, we'll be all right. So, I was living at home at the time. I, I just hadn't been out of school long and I, I wasn't married and I was living there. And so he said, well, you're about ready to go home. It was about 6.30 at night and we stayed open, you know, until the last person showed at that time and, and went to work about 6.30, 7 in the morning. Uh, he said, uh, so I said, no, I think I'll just stick around in case somebody else drops in. I didn't have anything to do. As soon as he left, uh, I told him, I said, they'll wait. He said, but you steak dinner. They got a new Chevrolet. And I said, your own, you know. So, so I go home and uh, or as soon as he leaves, I take off and I drive straight to their house, you know, and I can still see that new Chevrolet sitting there. You know? <laughs> so I drive home and he walks in, he said, what color was it? And I said, white. <laughs> and I said, he said, when you want to get that steak? I said, let's go get this over with. <laughs> and so we did. But we had that relation and it was fun relation all the time. And I stroll by his office and I said, how many of you sold today? Well, I sold two. And I said, well, I've sold three, and after a while he'd come back by, he'd sold three, you know. I mean, he was, he, we just, he couldn't stand it. And, but he came in one time and he said, son, we had back then, the girls in the office had to type contracts and they had to be perfect. And sometimes they, they made a mistake. He couldn't sign, you know, they had to be signed. And so the GMAC contracts. And so I, and I really enjoyed it somewhat because he had a customer and you'd close the deal and then you would get to visit with them. And so much of our business came out of Texas and places. Hugo and Oklahoma wasn't big enough to have a, the volume that we were 
selling and we had to pull people everywhere. And so you get to meet a lot of people and, and know people and, and, and they would come in and my boys later were doing the advertising on TV. They were a year and 17 days apart and, and people would come to see the Baggett boys. Everybody thought they were twins. We dressed them a lot alike and they were about the same size. And, but you'd get to know your customers somewhat. And I'd visit with them while the girls were doing, you know, just social, what they do and more like. And, and we'd get our paperwork done, whether it's a finance deal or not. Well, I looked up one day and he's out there and he's motioning for me. Come here, come here, you know. And so I'd go outside and it was, I'd sold him a blue, light blue LeSabre Buick. And, and so I, he says, uh, I went in and says, I've sold that car that you, that these people are buying. And I said, well, I've had them, you know, they're doing the paperwork on it, Dad. He says, well, says, why don't, why don't you see if you can sell them something else? Says, you're a lot better salesman than I am. All I ever heard was, you're a lot better salesman than I am. So I start back in the office and he, he goes on and sells the car to his people. I get to thinking, he sold me. Yeah. So I have to go in and tell my people that he's already sold it. Then I have to find him one. Well, back then you just didn't get on the computer and find it. So you, you, I finally located one. It took three days to salvage my deal out. I had to cut a little of it for expense and everything. Got back. Sold my people, you know, but I never forget walking back to his office that day after the, both parties left, and uh, I, I just stood at the door, and he's sitting there and had a little smirk on his face, you know. And I said, "I said, how would you do your own son that way?" He says, "What way?" I said, "You know what way?" I said, "You sold me." I said, "That'll not happen again." But but we just had that good relation, and, and he and Dr. Were, were like that too. They they like to play jokes on each other. They like to kid each other <clears throat> about this and that. Uh, it is a treasure, both of them, both of them. Then later in 86, I guess it was, I built a new facility east of town. We, we acquired Chevrolet Oldsmobile and uh, had uh, a large facility. I promised them, I actually promised them I would do it in about 82, but interest rates went so high and I said, if you want to come take those franchises back right now, I'm not going to go in debt at 20% interest. I, I can't can't do that. And they said, no, we don't want anyone building right now. So when it dropped down to around 15% interest rates at that time, I guess, well, I went ahead and, and locked up the deal and, and built the new I already had the property, and so I built the new facility. And, and he was he didn't want an office built out there. He said, I'm not. He, and I bought him out by that time, and he said, I'm not really into it. And I... I can't do you much good, and, and I said, "Why, well, yes, you can." And I, so, so I had to kind of misrepresent a little bit when they were building. He said, "What's this going to be?" And I had two nice offices side by side, and I said, oh, "We'll probably use this as a conference room or something." And and uh, he said, uh, "Well, right." So when we put carpet in, orange carpet, by the way, uh, <laughs> but when we put the carpet in the offices, uh, he said, "Well, you probably shouldn't have put, you know, they'll spill coffee and drinks in here if you're going to make it for us." you know, conference room. And so then I moved a big desk in, a big sofa so he could go and sleep if he wanted to and everything. And, and, uh, and he was, he was pretty touched, but he had, had the nicest office in town. And, uh, and he lived, uh, about five years, I guess, after we built, uh, he fished all the time and, uh, <laughs> not related to the, the story, but he would, uh, take, take one of the, sometime he'd have to take an employee fishing with him because, I wouldn't let him go by himself. <laughs> and, and he, if he couldn't find one of his buddies or they were busy or something, he, and go to the dock or whatever, so, and he'd say, "I'll just, I'll be, I'll be back." I said, "No, you take, take Chief with you or something." And so, Chief didn't mind going, of course, being paid to go fishing with him. But, but he was, he, he caught a lot of crappie and just uh, enjoyed life a lot. But, but uh, we moved there in '86, and then I, uh, I sold the dealership in '93. Uh, sales manager of mine, I, I had the opportunity to, to sell it and get out and enjoy life a little bit. And, and uh, my boys were in college about to graduate and they really didn't want to come back to Hugo. Uh, they, they'd seen the bright lights of the big city and we didn't really have many people in, uh, uh, in uh, information technology at Hugo, Oklahoma at that time when they graduated. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm proud they, they're both in Tulsa and done, done well there. OSU graduates. OSU graduates, married OSU girls, uh, met their wives there, uh, graduated there, just got back from attending my second 
Grand Paris University there with my grandson Garrett. Uh, the little girls are not quite old enough yet to go, but looking forward to taking them. Well, how did you come to choose OSU? Uh, actually, I went to Southeastern the very first year. Uh, I was going to be, I thought of, at that time, I wasn't sure about the automobile industry for me. I thought an optometrist, that's what I want to be. And so I, I found out that I could get into Houston optometry school. You had to have two, two uh, years of college and then you can apply. And a local optometrist was encouraging me. Uh, I thought, well, that's, that sounds like a pretty good deal, you know, five days a week. And, and my dad worked six and days a week, you know, in long hours. And, and, and I loved it. And when I got to Southeastern, I, uh, I took a chemistry course that I found out I wasn't qualified to take probably and, and didn't do well in it. And, I, and you had to have it, of course. And, and it just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying that portion of it. And my sister had gone up A&M at the time. And she had spent, she's four years older than I am. And, uh, and after the second year, or in her second year, she got married, and uh, and they uh, decided that they were going to go out and start their life, you know. And 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 her husband didn't finish at that time either. And they got married, moved to Dallas, had jobs, did well, but uh, just never did finish college. And Dad so wanted a, a college graduate in the family, uh, and it's because he didn't get to finish high school. And uh, so he, uh, I thought, well, and I was going to. Go to another school that had a pretty good football team always, and because uh, I because they won football games, you know, I thought well uh, in high school, and then I went to Southeastern, and I uh, thought this is not for me, and I was selling cars on the side at Southeastern and driving on the 52 miles to Hugo to pick up their car or whatever and take a car over, and I spend more time doing that, and so then I go to on to OSU, and and of course loved it. I went up one time, and the key word when I was uh, in high school. I visited another major university in the state, and, and they were somewhat snobbish, I would say, in atmosphere toward high school students at that time. And I'm, I'm not trying to say it was at all the time at all, but so I thought, this is, you know, I don't think I want to go there, school. This is the one that had a good football team most of the time. Uh, just wasn't me. And so I went over to see my sister there, and I'd been up once or twice before in high school deals, but everybody was wearing blue jeans, and the key word was howdy when you walked across campus. It wasn't anything, you know, and everybody spoke to you. It didn't matter that you were high school junior, senior, whatever. They spoke to you. And I, and I remember so excited when I came home and told my folks, I said, that's where I want to go to school. I said, that's, that's, that's it. And so... I selected it after, after I decided not to go on with the, the uh, optometry deal and uh, into the School of Business. Uh, have not regretted it whatsoever. Uh, got involved with a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of dear friends still today. Lived in Bennett Hall, uh, had, knew a lot of the football players uh, there, and wrestlers, and, and loved it. Uh, every minute of the issue, I guess uh, I loved. Uh, good experiences, bad experiences, uh, they all they are great. Um, still have many good friends I see. Uh, Jerry Gill, dear, dear friend. When the, uh, Merle Rogers uh, that preceded Merle. Uh, Peggy, my sister, worked for Merle when she was there. Um, and she, uh, she was quite a student. She, she made the dean's honor roll, you know, and things. And I had a little, of course, I followed her through high school. I, had to, I knew it was going to be tough to <laughs> match up, which I wasn't going to do. And, and so, uh, Came back one time and Dad said, well, did you make the dean's list? Uh, dean is on a roll. And I said, no, Dad, but I'm on the dean's list. And I said, he knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but I told him, I said, when I walk in there, they know who I am, Dad. And he, he, he thought that was good. <laughs> I said, but it wasn't the dean's on a roll. <laughs> so, but uh, we had fun over that, too. But I, I enjoyed every year, every, every moment on campus got involved a little bit in several organizations, uh, more in my marketing group, I guess, in the School of Business. Uh, uh, just would live up there. What was uh, your to, major? Business marketing. And business what marketing. year did you graduate? I graduated actually in 65. I uh, In Southeastern, I, I got shingled, to be perfectly honest, and dropped, had to drop some hours. And then I, uh, I it would, took January 65, I, I 
I guess it's when I graduated. I should have been out actually a year or so before, but I had to take a short load uh, semester over there and get special permission to, to be under 12 hours. Military draft if you weren't. So, and then I had I lost some hours from that didn't transfer. So, when I, when I went in up there, I was actually still a freshman uh, the next year uh, by several hours. You know, so it took took a little longer for me to graduate uh, four and a half years, I guess. But but it was tremendous. Uh, I, I, like I say, I got involved and, and still the people that some in the dorms that I met at that time were still good friends. Uh, some of the football players that played Leland Slack. And, he would come down and buy cars from me until, until I sold out out here from Tulsa, and uh, I still see him occasionally. Uh, got involved. Uh, Merle, Ho uh, Merle Rogers, as I said, was alumni. Uh, he encouraged my uh, involvement somewhat. Uh, just numerous, numerous people, but uh, served on the alumni board for several years, uh, representing this area. Then uh, Jerry asked me to serve on the executive committee. Uh, so I did that and then eventually became uh, national president uh, and working with Jerry. I worked, worked with primarily with Dr. John Campbell at the time. Uh, grew to be great, great friends of John and Eunice Campbell. Uh, and he was there a short time, but it was my tenure as uh, president of the university. One of the most disappointing uh, things that I guess I had as far as president was my son Greg was president of the SAE fraternity, and uh, so they were so excited homecoming, you know, and they were going to win this deal. And they always had good house decks, so, you know, they, they always did up there. And, and that's a story that you could go on and on about homecoming uh, at OSU and, and its alumni function, as you know. But Greg told me, he said, Dad, you're going to be president. I'm going to be president. He says, Nothing I'd love more to walk out on that field and you present us with that first first place prize. I said, "Well, you're the only one that can do that," you know. And I said, uh, "I said," and he said, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna work for it." And all they did, it showed, he did. He learned a good lesson. That one of the requirements were was you have some place on your display "Welcome Home Alums" or, or "Welcome OSU Alums" or something. They left that part off, and that's they would have won the. The deal that they, they they placed real high, but they got knocked down, and it just really made him sick that that he didn't get to do that. And uh, I said, well, the, the good news, I guess, is the fact that if you came out there and just said, hey, that was a fixed deal, you know, the father, uh, president of the uh, alumni association. But, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a good ride. I've enjoyed all my association. But you could, you know, live ever anywhere. You know, uh, why do you, why did you choose to, you know, make your home here in Hugo? The business, uh, want to come back. Uh, my dad told me after about three, in fact, he encouraged me. I, I had an opportunity to go to work for Phillips Petroleum at the time when I graduated. Uh, he wanted me to interview some people and, and they offered me a, a, a nice salary and everything. And in fact, it was quite a bit nicer than what I got when I came. And he was, he said, well, you ought to try it. And I came home one weekend and told him, I said, well, I've been offered a job with Phillips Petroleum. And, and the Phillips distributor is who I worked for here uh, at the time. Of course, it had no connection with the, the interviewer or anything like that. But I, and we had a Phillips 66 station that was kind of in the back of my mind. So when they came to campus, I interviewed. And I can't recall that guy's name. I did until a few years ago. And I, you know, he's long gone, I'm sure, by now, because he was an older gentleman. And he, he just kind of took a liking to me, and, and, and he offered me this position and at Bartlesville. And I thought, hmm, not a bad deal. So I came home one weekend, I was telling Dad about it, and it was, I think the school teachers were paying something, getting paid around $3,900 a year that at this particular time, and, and recent graduates. And they offered me 10000 a year. And, and I thought, wow. So he said, why don't you just try it? And I said, well, Dad, I said, I hate to do that because I really want to be in the car business. And he said, well, you can do that later if you don't like this. So he pretty well had me convinced going back to school and I was going to make that decision. I got to school that night and I called home. I said, you know, I'm not going to take that job. I said, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't do my job. I'm coming back to Hugo and, that's, and uh, I'm going to get in the car business. And 
So he said, boy, you don't learn too well. <laughs> so, but I came back and, and, and it was great because uh, it, it relieved a lot of pressure off him. I was able to reach people he could not reach. Didn't reach all of them. That one guy I didn't reach, but, <laughs> but uh, I gave him good financial advice. But he, he told me, he said, son, we're not in the financial advice business. We're in the car business. And he said, uh, sometimes you have to sell them when they come, whether they can it's what they need or not. And, and it was a good lesson other than the fact that I lost a steak dinner on that deal. But but I did, I never regretted not taking the job with someone else. Uh, I think I think I found my niche in life. I think I found what I wanted to do. Uh, it's been good to me uh, on numerous trips all over the nation and world to see the world first class, so to speak, and uh, met so many people in the automobile industry that, that I treasure also. I used to furnish a car for the Wagon Wheel Club at, you know, uh, at a sports deal. Uh, furnished then when Jerry moved over to the, that's where I met Jerry. Uh, he, he was driving the car and when he was uh, uh, raising the fund, fundraiser more or less for the agri uh, athletic department. And then when he took the job at, at the OSU alumni, well, he says, you want to move over there? So I can't give you all the privileges that you get. So yeah, I said, sure, I'll, I, I'll I'll furnish a car to you over there too, and, and he drove several of my cars over the years. Well, as we we kind of come towards the end of our interview, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you'd like to say about you know how you you see the relationship between uh, the circus and the Hugo community today? I think it's still good for particularly the people that that know the circus people that know the. Uh, what all they mean to this area. Uh, David Rawls was mayor here. Uh, you know, you just you just can't walk into a position like that. Uh, and it's a position, it's a hard position to be a mayor of a small community. Uh, and we were all in favor. And what, those that knew David and how brilliant he is, uh, were in favor of him uh, taking that position and, and, and he served us well. There'd be other people that didn't like him because they didn't get certain things or something, you know, how it is in politics and, and things like that. but. But all in all, he did an outstanding job. Uh, he couldn't have received it without support of the community, you know, to have somebody that's not been here but three months out of the year all of his life, but he was always here and, and doing things. Uh, and always, you know, whatever it was civic-wise, he said several of them served as uh, president of the chambers and things like that. They, they're just, uh, or been involved with the chamber work. Uh, but when they come back and retire, they the ones that retire here stay involved here. So I, I think that the reception, uh, but so many of the people, the young people, and, and I'm talking about my age people that know them, uh, so many of the younger people, they're, they're related to, my boys were friends of uh, the Bird girls, of course, in the same age group, and, and they're still true friends, and they communicate all the time and, and just treasure that deal. So in, in general, John Q. Public here and the, the people that are moved in here with various companies and things do not know what the circus has done for Hugo, Oklahoma, uh, a lot more than we've done for the circus. With, with your connections to the circus and you've traveled to see it various places, mm -hmm. as the, a member of the audience, do you have a favorite part? Oh, well, I've always... <clears throat> I, of course, everybody loves the clowns because you'd like to see the children laugh, you know, and they and they do. And 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 did, I watch I watch the little children probably more in the show because I've seen so much. <clears throat> I love the elephants. Cannot understand how you can trade take a huge animal like that and trade it to walk out on a beam. I mean, and do a headstand with his feet up in the air and, and balancing on this two front feet on a eight inch beam, steel beam. How do you ever get it to know what you want it to do? <laughs> you know, in an elephant, how do, how do they communicate? Uh, the I never was big on the the cat acts that they've had. I, I've always scared somebody. I'd see someone get maimed or something. But 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 those people love their animals. Um, but just watching the crowd, just seeing it, you know, that's the the film industry today is is so trashy and even when you watch these shows about who's going with who and all this and and all the and I, i'm not going to name any names of some of these stars that think because they're a star they can get by with everything uh 
you don't see that in the circus. You know, these are these are people that love. They they love what they do. They work hard hours. They're uh, they're just genuine, hardworking, good people. That's had kind of a bad image whenever they go someplace. Uh, and it's not a carnival. You know, carnivals. They've got the game shows and all these things, and they try to trick you. And we we have those come in with the county fairs and things like that. But circus. They're, they're performers, uh, they're professional people, they're good people. And, and I, I, uh, I don't know, I just, I get so upset when, when people kind of downgrade them, and particularly the elephants uh, and the treatment that the circuses have given to these elephants. And I, uh, I did write a letter in to PETA, at, or to the Daily Oklahoma one time, because PETA had said, called uh, one act after two years of uh, they said uh, traveling with the circus uh, uh, secretly, they, they found one item of abuse, and it was he kind of cursed the elephant and, and and did you know used the gaff a little bit harder than possible, but but they love those animals and they name the elephants after their after their family members and they they don't mistreat them. They they live better than most horses in in, in these stables that you see in these fancy places. They, they really, they have their own playground to go out and dig in the mud uh, thing. But, uh, and I love the Alpha Acts. They used to bring the show in and they'd stack them up at the end of the show, uh, one on top of the other, you know, just where they raised up on top of the other one. And, and they, uh, they'd be like 15 or 20 in a row and it was very impressive to do that. But, but to see the little kids, uh, you know, Hollywood needs to clean up their act. Uh, this is the only place you can take a child today and see good, clean entertainment. Even the clown acts are good, you know. They may put on a little skit or something, and, and uh, where clown ladies got bloomers or whatever on, and then and they, something pulls the top dress off. But it's nothing like you see in Hollywood or in some of some other things. And I and I think it's a good deal for the kids to to be able to go and laugh. Even even kids that you know, have had a tough time, you know. And today we have so many more kids without without uh, two parents. Uh, even though they're both living, but they're not living together. And, and I see I see those little kids out there enjoying. And uh, I work a lot with the shelter workshop people. And we have, uh, we always make sure that they they get to go to the circus when it comes, when it sets up. But truly, too, without the show itself, probably the setting up uh, of the morning. If you've not seen that, bring that big top up. and. Uh, set the show up, it's, it's something. They use elephants, and of course they use a lot of machinery now. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention real quick, and, I, and I, talking about things that they've done, one year or two or three years, so Hugo made the final playoffs in football, and, there, and we were expecting a bigger crowd than our stadium could, could handle. And I thought, DR's got those trucks, and there's a track, a, ra uh, a running track uh, around the stadium. So I mentioned to him, you know, to them, I said, hey, you know, we need an extra seating. What would it cost us to bring your trucks in? And, and it, nothing. You know, they brought the trucks in, set up the bleachers. They just wheeled those big trucks in, left them tractors hooked up to them. And they set up, I, I don't know, probably five or six of them on the other north side where there's no, we just have one side of stands. And, and the other side had bleed in like that. No charge. You know, just. Hey, we want we want to see the people come in and enjoy, and that's, and that's just the way. That, no one ever knew there was no charge. No one, everybody probably thought, well, they got rich off this or something. But, but they they was they're like that. They really are the good good people. Well, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we close out today? Oh, probably talk too much now, but uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know. Uh, I uh, I invite you to to come back and I invite everyone. It's that might see this to, to come visit the circus. It's uh, it's just a, it's kind of like part of American, American heritage in a sense. Because uh, ever since it's been growing, there's been a medicine man or somebody coming by uh, over the years. And, and when you uh, when you see these people, just appreciate what they <clears throat> what they do every day to, to bring entertainment to your town. They're the largest tent circus in the world, uh, this one is. And, and all of our circuses here have been tent circuses primarily where Ringling Brothers now travel only by train and rail and a wonderful circus too. But uh, this is a, this one is the second largest in the world. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.